Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. Woohoo! We're back! Are you, we've been back. <laughs> we're back again. We're, we're not making this the new normal. <sighs> this is the new normal, man. Yeah. We were just talking about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm a man. I, I can't. I'm so tired of hearing that phrase. Dude, that phrase is a bad one, I tell you. Uh, like I was telling you before we went on, I was at the DMV the other day, and um, I got into a little That already backing. sounds terrible. <laughs> it, well, it was horrible, dude. Um, and like I was telling you, I got into a little back and forth with the cop. It was actually fun. Like, I enjoyed it. It was nice to have a little debate with forced audience. <laughs> mm. But, um, yeah, one of the guys through me and him talking was made a comment about new normal and everybody in there like turned on him and looked like, what, what did you just say? Say it again. Cause <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. Like, no, you're not alone in not wanting to hear that term. Yeah. I want it, things to get back to normal. I don't, I don't want new normal. You don't want to accept this new world we live uh, in. No, I don't. I don't. Oh. Not at all. I, I reject this entirely. Yeah, everything about it. Yeah, um, I don't know what to. Uh, so you came in here kind of in a huff. So I guess you had a great day at work. Oh man, it's been a long day. It's just you know, there's a lot going on. I mean, this is the new normal. Like, right? This is, this is kind of how the world we live in. It's just I work in retail and it's it's busy right now. But part of it is, is we're down here in the south, and the beach traffic is crazy right now. So oh yeah, you're on the uh, every. I'm not. I'm not on 59, so I'm not on like the main drag to the beach. But mm. I feel like a lot of this is beach business that we're yeah. picking up. You're like a quarter mile or a half mile from 59. Though, yeah, aren't you? I'm right yeah. off 59. Yeah. yeah, probably quarter mile off 59. So yeah. yeah, I mean we're but it's and and the beaches. I think we talked about it on one of the podcasts. Are just crazy right now. Like the beaches are crazy yeah everybody wants to get outside again well and, uh, people... and not just in the street <laughs> exactly <laughs> well i think a lot of people are afraid to make like the big disney trip or go to like the theme parks mm -hmm. and whatnot and the beach is an easy alternative you're outside you know yeah well disney had talked about shutting down for like a year and a half or something yeah. somewhere along well, the way. Well, I think they're, I think they've opened back up now. If they haven't, they're fixing to, they're going to be open back up for when I was supposed to make my trip, which was, in, which is in Thanksgiving, which I don't know if we're going to make the Disney trip or not. Yeah. We're well, on the I was going to say they're, they're open for that time period so far. Yeah. What, what All, if there's another spike? Well, it, it could very easily <laughs> change. One of the big things that turned me off about making the Disney trip is they're forcing you to wear the mask like the whole time you're in the park. Oh, um, and that just sounds like a bad experience. Yeah. I mean, got a bunch of kids. Yeah. Well, that's the most ridiculous part, right? Like yeah. the, the kids have shown very little susceptibility to this. So why make the kids that you're already going to have enough trouble controlling also wear a mask? Yeah. No, it just it doesn't sound like a good time. And like I said, we were going with a bunch of my family. I just don't know if that's something that's... Yeah. We'd rather go to the beach. I don't know if you um, heard about this, because uh, I heard... Uh, m Mom told me, um, but a friend of ours was tossed off a plane for not wearing a mask because he was... Ah, yes. Um, so I, I know who... Yeah, that's a friend of mine, too. Yeah, I, I, I heard about this. Didn't yeah. I say a friend of ours? Oh, yeah. Maybe you did. <laughs> well, I know who you're talking about, yeah. though. Yeah. Like, um, who he Because he, he was having an asthma attack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they, they, yeah, I saw the video from that. It was pretty crazy. Oh, like really? He, yeah, he's wanting to get. I don't know where he stands with all of that, but he's wanting to get an attorney and whatnot. Yeah. Because like, there was, it's in this one of those videos. I mean, I know I've got a pretty good idea of what happened because I trust the friend. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the person watching the video doesn't know what all transpired before that. You know. Yeah. But the video is pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, the new normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> speaking of the new normal um we were talking on the last podcast about how the the mob can be as big a threat to liberty as the government yeah um and maybe more so to you know i i brought in the uh clip from dave smith i might just do that again for uh, those who haven't heard it i think it's a good one to hear yeah uh, instead of just stealing his material because um, yeah. you're never supposed to do that to a comedian. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, we, we can stick that in right around here. The state is a threat to our liberty, um, but the mob is an equal threat to li uh, liberty and a bigger threat to any sense of order at all, which is also important. 
I just wanted to call back to, you know, just kind of some recent, especially in the wake of the, the uh, coronavirus stuff and now um, the protests and riots and everything else around it, um, that we've seen a lot of this, of uh, contrary opinions just being thrown out yeah. um, all over the place. And, you know, like I can see some limitations on things that are factually untrue, like just, you know, fact check false stuff. Yeah. Um, but opinions can't really be that way. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. so I'm, well, I'm just kind of, and I've, I've seen more and more of that. I wish I had like a solemn example to give you, but I've seen it multiple times recently where we're exactly what you're saying, where somebody's fact checking something that's clearly an opinion, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's, there's, you, like I said, you can believe whatever you want. You know? yeah. Libertarianism is the best system. Agreed. Yeah. You can fact check that all you want. Yeah. You're not going to find good examples because nobody's let it happen yet. Yeah. Uh, but it's like, not we, falsifiable. We, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they might claim it is. Yeah. I, you know. Um, well, here's the, the couple of immediate examples of you know, things that have happened in the last few weeks. And then we can go farther back if you want. Um, the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, posted a an op ed in their paper um, called "Buildings Matter Too." Oh yeah, and it was just a you know an opinion piece about how um, the uh, the rioters, not the protesters, were going to be try and be very clear about separating those two groups of people. Although I think that one can become the other. Oh yeah, but. Um, anyway, uh, that they were doing damage to a, a bunch of historical buildings, um, that while they can be replaced to some degree, yeah. you know, that this, this is a real damage to the cultural, um, history of the community and so forth. Well, yeah. I mean, it's just like bombing the Sphinx or something, you know, I mean, yeah. you, like, I mean, yeah, and maybe nobody died, but it still sucks. Yeah. <laughs> like, you I, don't want to do that. Like, Napoleon's army already knocked the nose off the Sphinx and people were really upset about that. Well, yeah, but, and, and as they should be, I mean, come yeah. on, like, don't do, don't do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but then there was this huge outcry about how he was comparing buildings to the lives of black people. Yeah. Uh, in the op-ed, and um, the result was that the uh, editor-in-chief of the Philadelphia Inquirer had to, was forced to resign. Oh, really? Yeah. And in a similar vein, um, the uh, editor of the New York Times was forced to resign um, for publishing the op-ed from Tom Cotton uh, about the use of military against the uh, rioters. Isn't Tom Cotton still a sitting senator? Yes, Tom Cotton is still a sitting senator. Like, I thought so. Like, I mean, I know the name, and I, I thought he was still around. Like, yep, <laughs> he is. Um, so the op-ed by the sitting senator uh, was deemed, um, uh, you know, unfit for publishing by the staff, uh, apparently, <laughs> of the New York Times, and the editor was forced to resign as a result. Wow. Now, I think that regardless of what you think of the opinion— um, the opinion about the use of military force by a sitting senator might be something that's worth publishing. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the whole idea is that we need to know where these people stand. So if, if his stance is so bad, we still need to know it. I mean, he's he's a member of office. Like, yeah, I, mean, I disagree with him, too, but I'm glad to, I, like yeah. I want to know when he has yeah. these kind of things to say. Well, absolutely. Because hopefully people won't vote for him again. Well, that's the whole idea. <laughs> like, why would you want to suppress that? Yeah. Um, I, and I agree. And so I, when I initially saw that story, it was on RT and they started talking about what they were calling consensus reporting. Yeah. And I, I like this term, um, consensus reporting. So and define this cause I haven't, I, I don't know this term. Well, as well, I, as far as I know, it's new, but, yeah. um, essentially what they were saying is that, um, if the news is subject to the approval of the staff of whatever paper yeah. like a group of journalists get together and agree that that is news yeah um and, or that's the the part of the news that should be released to the public yeah. that would be consensus reporting hmm. um or consensus journalism yeah <clears throat> and it's dangerous because it i mean it you know it just feeds into what we think that the media that major media is trying to do anyway which is just to control the narrative yeah um 
Which and, this is true. I mean, this is absolutely what what each individual one is trying to do. I mean, they mm-hmm. all have an, their own agenda that they're trying to push. Well, it, the problem is that a lot of them have a shared agenda. Well, yeah. Well, and that that's true too. <clears throat> and at least in the you know on the important stuff. Yeah. You know. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of people speaking out against the war. Mainstream mm-hmm. media sources speaking out against the the um, that we're keeping troops in Syria or yeah. um, that we haven't pulled out of Afghanistan yet, or or, or even the um, the national security stuff as far as like mm-hmm. the um, NSA and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, the they, surveillance state the, stuff. Yeah, they don't. You don't hear. I mean, they're in locked stuff as far as that's concerned. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, you know, the, this is a danger, uh, and the whole point of media is to try and prevent, present information, um, to the public at large, n- not to steer the conversation, but to provide the information for the, the public to make its own decisions. Absolutely. At least that's what I think. I mean, yeah. that, that's an ideal world and I don't think it's ever existed that way. Yeah. Um, but you look at it in the, in the case of the coronavirus stuff and it's the same thing. Um, the idea that this may not be as bad as they were claiming, we, we might not all die. Um, oh, you're not hearing that. I mean, and it's, it's actually funny to watch them straddle between siding with the protesters and siding with the virus. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, um, here's a good place to, to insert a clip. Uh, that I actually had for the last show, but we didn't end up talking about this stuff. So yeah. um, let's listen to this renowned cardiologist talk about um, the the coronavirus and the use of masks. Universal masking, having the entire country wear a mask in public would have dramatically reduced the death rate in this country. It's not up for debate. It's just science. So... Anytime you hear somebody that claims to be a scientist say that this is not disputable, <laughs> you can pretty much ignore everything they say after that. The science is settled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is not up for debate. Yeah. That no, that, that's completely wrong. That is what science is, is debate. Yeah. The whole We've idea, talked about this so many times on this podcast. I, I think we had the discussion on the podcast actually about gravity. Like, I mean, if if gravity is in is in dispute, mm-hmm. like Everything is in dispute as far as I'm concerned. Like, yeah. I mean, like, if the science ain't settled on gravity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, gravity's under attack. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, uh, the science is more settled on um, the uh, evolution by natural selection than it is on gravity <laughs> than right it is now. on gravity, right? But one of them is being debated about whether it can be included in textbooks without a, a, a little statement that says that this is just a theory. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the other one is the law of, of gravity. gravity yeah. right? <laughs> right. A little backwards. But, um, I mean, we saw this with the coronavirus stuff on, uh, you had YouTube and Facebook banning posts. And this is the funny thing to me is because they you know, this guy is saying that there's a scientific consensus and therefore it's indisputable. Like, same kind of thing that they do with with, uh, global climate change, right? Yeah. Um, That there's a consensus on this and so therefore it's indisputable. And because all the scientists agree, or 97%, it's always 97%. It's always 97, yep. So 97% of scientists agree. Um, But the, the funny thing about that is that, or the ironic thing, I suppose, um counterintuitive anyway whatever you'd like to call it is that facebook and youtube were taking down uh posts from mds that were um you know speaking out against the narrative of the the danger of the coronavirus or what exactly it was doing or the number of people that were dying or whatever whatever yeah. whichever one you want to pick right yeah. yeah um and the the thing that's funny about that is that they claim that you know ninety seven percent of scientists agree, and et cetera. so they're making an appeal to authority of why you have to believe that global climate change is the thing that's you know man made is going to destroy us all if we don't do something about it, yeah. or that uh, you know the appeal to authority that all the doctors agree that we're you know we're all going to die if we don't stay six feet apart and wear masks um, or whatever it happens to be. But then these particular authorities, these are MDs too. 
Yeah. You know, um, they're thrown out. Their ideas are thrown out. You you can just ignore them because they don't agree with the consensus. And yeah. if you start doing that with news as well, I, I think that that's a dangerous path to follow. Oh, it absolutely is. Um, but it's this whole cancel culture thing. And yeah. that's where it ties back into the mob being just as dangerous to liberty as, as the state. Yeah. I don't know if I would say just as dangerous, but I see the point anyway. Well, yeah. Um, because this is one of those things that you're talking about... Uh, you know, trampling on people's rights to free speech when you're talking about Facebook or Twitter or whatever, oh. um, taking down posts and, and things like that. Um, but the the First Amendment only talks about the government. Yeah. It, it constrains the government, not uh, private um, private business. Yeah. And uh, so they're welcome to do this stuff. They're perfectly legally able to do this stuff. Um, but it's all in response to a, a, a group of radical individuals that say that you're not allowed to have this thought. And they're not even really the majority. They're just oh, no. the vocal minority. Absolutely. Uh, you had the um, the thing this past week with uh, Drew Brees, the quarterback of the New Orleans Saints. Um, in an interview, he said that he thought that the kneeling to the flag uh, was disrespectful and that uh, you know he couldn't respect somebody that would disrespect the flag like that. Uh, or that he would never see eye to eye with somebody that would disrespect the flag, all that. Um, now, that's all you heard in the media, by the way. If you go back and listen to his full statement, it was perfectly reasonable as far as I can tell. Now, yeah. I, I'm not saying that I agree with him necessarily. I think he mistook the meaning of, you know, the people kneeling. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, he's entitled to his opinion about it. But well, if that's... you listen to the whole statement, it was really a message of unity. He's talking about how... Um, you know, the sacrifices, what he thinks of when he looks at the flag is the sacrifices of all the people that brought us to this point, yeah. um, to that his grandfathers that, that fought in World War II and the um, leaders of the civil rights movement that risked so much um, to, to get equality or something closer to it, yeah. um, you know, for the minorities and so forth. And that he sees, uh, he sees it as a symbol of unity that we're all in this together. I think that's actually a pretty good message. Yeah, oh, um, absolutely. But he, I mean, that's, I don't necessarily see all those things when I see the flag, but that goes back to interpretation. Like different people see different things, you know. Yeah. Well, and the, you know, the interesting part is that that was essentially Shannon Sharp's response. Yeah. Um, Shannon Sharp on a one of these programs. He's a commentator. He's a retired football fl- player and a commentator now. Yeah. Um, and uh, he. Uh, went on this rant about Drew Brees not understanding things and that if he thinks that black men see the same thing when they look at the flag, then he's dead wrong. And, um, you know, that uh, he, it was, you know, absurd what Drew said and terrible and, and disrespectful itself and, you know, so yeah. on. And what I thought when I listened to him is like, okay, Drew Brees has his opinion of what the flag means when he looks at it. Yeah. You have your opinion of what the flag means when you look at it. It's different than his. Why is the way you look at the flag okay, but the way he looks at the flag wrong? Well, and that's that goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning with like trying to fact check opinion. Mm-hmm. Like this, this is just what that guy believes, you know, and he has every right to believe it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not, it's not fair to, and he's already went and apologized and all of this. He now. should never have apologized. I've never been so disappointed in Drew Brees as when he came out and apologized for that. Never apologized. It didn't gain him anything. Well, and and, and he was clearly is, speaking from the heart when he talked about what he thought when he looked at the flag. And this is advice for anybody who says something when you speak from the heart and when you really say something and mean something and mean it, and you have. Have a backlash for it stand behind it more people will stand with you if you stand behind what you said like he gains nothing by apologizing yeah. like the people that he was that were angry at him aren't going to forgive him for apologizing mm-hmm. and the people that agreed with him and thought that he had a good opinion on it are going to walk away from him too you mm-hmm. lose everybody when yeah. you when you apologize so this is just free advice for anybody that's working with the public out yeah. there well that one and that was the first thing that Shannon Sharp said his rant came after the first apology yeah. maybe after the second apology cuz Drew Brees delivered two separate apologies on this yeah. um, and he said that apology doesn't mean anything yeah exactly well, shouldn't have said it then he, sh- he should have just stood by what he said because because he believed what he said he wouldn't have yeah. said it and with as much passion and stuff as he did if he didn't mm-hmm. so and just as a side note here I was so irritated with his teammates uh, taking to Twitter um, to uh, you know pile on 
um, Drew Brees and talk about how he, you know, how terrible it was what he said. Yeah. Um, his teammates, they have his cell phone number. Like, why wouldn't you just call the guy Handle and say, some "Hey, private. yeah, exactly." Yeah. I mean, but the, obviously, the reason they went on Twitter is to virtue signal. Absolutely, <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. Because yeah. that's because that's what it is. Like that's all it is. Yeah. Um, I don't know if your company is doing this. I was in Walmart today, and uh, they there was a public service announcement from the CEO or something on the uh, you know where they have all the TVs. <laughs> uh, hooked up in the back. I think it really? went over the the monitor overhead too. The um, oh, the where they play the music. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it was definitely on the TVs. Yeah. Where he comes out and says, you know, we, we side with the black community, and um, you know, I even hate using that term. By the way, the black community, like they're some yeah. kind of monolithic group that all live in the same place. I, I don't. <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, you know the. Anything that we can do to, you know, to support these communities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I, all the companies are doing it. Um, we didn't do, we haven't went that far as to put it over a television, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. but all of these big companies are doing the same thing and it's, it's, it's just pointless. I mean, there's not really a whole, nothing's coming from that. I think it's insulting. I, I, I mean, I would be insulted. I, I yeah. was kind of insulted. Like I listened to that and I, I said some curse under my breath, um, when it came on and it's not that I think that the message is wrong or, oh, or yeah. whatever it's, it, that's not what it is. You it's just, that I know that he doesn't care. It's just, <laughs> it's just pandering. It's and just business. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, that's just it. You're just, you're just pandering to a group mm -hmm. and it's, it's just not useful. Well, and the, the thing that I think is funny about it is that my guess is that the only people that that actually, those kind of messages actually impact is, you know, middle class white liberals, probably young middle class white liberals. Yeah. Um, that I suspect that the black community sees right through that crap. Yeah. Um, and says, yeah, I've been listening to this kind of lip service for 60 years and, uh, I just, I, it doesn't mean anything to me now. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And as long as we're on the cancel culture thing, we've got the new movement, uh, internationally uh, to start tearing down statues again. Yeah. So like I say, I was, um, I listen to NPR, not a lot, but I usually listen to it on the way to record for some mm -hmm. reason. It just happens to be kind of when I listen to it and man, like so, everything they discussed, they shifted it to to race. Like everything, no matter what it was. But the statue thing, like, kept coming up. They must have had two guests between here and the house talking about statues, um, which is interesting for us here in Alabama. So they actually have a a law written on the books that you can't take those statues down. Mm -hmm. Um, like it's, there's like mobiles right now. They took one down. They didn't announce it. They just, um, I forget which one, but they took it down unannounced, just woke up one morning and it was gone. Yeah. Um, and they're in debates right now of what they're going to, they haven't decided what they're going to do. They just took it down, mm -hmm. but they stand to face like a, I think it was like a $30,000 fine. The city does. Yeah. If they, now if they take it down for like repairs or refurbishments, then they don't face any fine at all. Mm -hmm. But, and that's what the mayor, when was interviewed about it said, he was like, well, we haven't decided what we're going to do. We may face a fine what, no matter what we do. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of figuring out what, what we're going to do, but they just, I, and that, I didn't really find out who made the decision to pull it, but that's. But I thought that was an interesting law to have on the books that you will yeah. fine a city or municipality for taking down a statue, like who in their location, yeah, in their like, domain. I mean, we on this show we we stand for personal for personal like government at home, like you yeah. know, and and to me that's like. A, a major intrusion yeah. on that. Well, but did the city ask the people if they wanted the statue down? Well, Here's one of the interesting things that I've seen in this. Um, uh, there was some uh, uh, like 19th century imperialist in England that whose statue they tore down. They also tore down a statue of Abraham Lincoln. My first thought there was, why does England have a statue of Abraham Lincoln? But <laughs> right. anyway, um, this uh, this old imperialist... Uh, who, you know, had been, you know, somehow a part of the slave trade, but certainly part of the, the, uh, 
imperial expansion of the of Great Britain. Yeah. And uh, but he'd also, you know, there's a bunch of buildings and things named after him in this particular place because he used the wealth that he generated doing that um, and invested in his community and built. You know, all, all these buildings that are still there 200 years later, the, you know, public buildings that are still there. Yeah. Um, but they tore down the statue and I was they were interviewing one of the uh, protesters about it. And they said, well, we've we've campaigned over and over and over again to get this statue taken down and they haven't done it. Yeah. Like, OK, well, then so we're all for democracy as long as it's working in our favor. But when it doesn't, then mob rule. I, I mean, I just. Yeah. And that's that's basically what those people believe. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I suppose that's true. They're they're uh, tearing down statues of Winston Churchill in uh, oh, really? in England. Yeah. I, I mean, and the guy was a bastard. There's no doubt about that. I, yeah. Like he was not a he was not a good person, but he helped you know, guide them through World War Two. There's got to be some kind of... <laughs> right, there's know. some kind of redeeming aspect here, yeah. right? Um, you know, it, there's, like, he was he was a terrible racist, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. But product of the times. Yeah. And, you know, there are certainly some uh, some redeeming qualities of the guy. Um, and he'd been know. lauded up until now. I've heard a ton of quotes now. from him. I, like, I, I thought, yeah. I always thought he had, like, the best quotes. I don't know a lot about the man, but yeah, he was funny. Yeah. <laughs> I, one of my favorites is, uh, this is the kind of English up with which I will not put. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the, you know, like I get it. I understand. But you can't you can't appease everybody. And um, I was well, reading. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and that's, that's where you end up with, that's where the real problem is, is trying to appease everybody. Because, so when I was listening to NPR, they were talking to this guy. And he was, of course, wanting some statue taken down. I don't know which one. Um and so the the per, the moderator asks, well, what would you have put up in their place? And and he had he was like, well, something that's going to bring people together and something to show unity. But the truth is, you'd never get people to agree on what to replace them with. I mean, you just you wouldn't like. I mean, yeah, it's, it's everything's gonna. Well, I, I like to uh, to quote Captain Malcolm Reynolds in this particular <laughs> right. place, um, who said. Uh, in my estimation, there's never been a man had a statue made out of him that wasn't one kind of son of a bitch or another. <laughs> there you go. True words have never been spoken. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, you know that's the that's probably the truth. Anybody that would be uh, famous or um, had enough of an impact that would be worth putting a statue up has offended somebody. Exactly. Exactly. And there, you know, there's no way around it. And I just think the whole thing's absurd. Um, I, uh, I actually pulled a, uh, down a quote years ago from uh, Chris Ann Hall from one of her podcasts. Yeah. Didn't write down which one or anything, so I can't play you the clip because she's got like 5,000 podcasts out there. Like, <laughs> she's there's busy. There's <laughs> no way that I'm going to find it again. But I did write it down. Yeah. Um, so I can at least read it to you. Right. Um, she said, uh, and, and it might have been about tearing statues down you know, Even a couple then, of years ago. Because this has been going on yeah. for a while, yeah. Um, but I, I don't remember exactly. But uh, she said... Uh, Lost lessons must be repeated. You do not change the history. What you do create is a resentment among your neighbors. You deny your children valuable lessons and doom our posterity to repeat the mistakes of our past. Yeah. Um, and I was reading a uh, blog. Uh, this is the Moon of Alabama blog that I go to pretty regularly. This is a, a German, I think, retired intelligence something or other. He provides a lot of insight. Yeah. I, I often disagree with this guy, by the way. <laughs> he is definitely way left of me politically. But... Yeah. Um, He's, you know, he provides interesting insight and he was talking about this phenomenon and saying that, uh, in, in German, they have two different words for monuments. Um, and I can't remember what the words were and I couldn't pronounce them correctly. So I'm not going to anyway. butcher the German, uh, here for everybody, but, um, essentially they have a, uh, a thinking mark, uh, how it translates is a thinking mark and, uh, like an admonition, uh, mark. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the thinking mark is supposed to be something that's very positive, uh, that everybody would feel good about. Yeah. Um, and the admonition mark is, uh, is a mark of some historical significance that's more of a warning or a reminder of how things can go. Yeah. Um, and he said, you know, what you do when you run into these kind of situations in Germany is oftentimes is they just move, they change it from a thinking mark to an admonition mark by adding additional information. Hmm. Um, and, uh, 
you know, so sometimes it's just like a, a plaque that puts it in historical context. Um, yeah. or they might add another piece, uh, to the sculpture or art or, or what have you. Um, and you know, artists have plenty of ideas of how to do this to kind of bring it more into perspective. And that's uh, to me, almost, that sounds like a good compromise in this whole statue debate Absolutely. as it is. I mean, like maybe not take the statues down, but maybe update the placards or something. Mm -hmm. And, and Honestly, or add another statue next to it of the of something you know. else, and well, we're, we're, I mean, every situation would be a little different because HBO I'm sure, pulled Gone with the Wind. Yeah, well, that's that's not even the what's here's what's sad. That's not even the worst example I've heard this week, uh, because the big thing that I heard was that, and I don't watch Paw Patrol, but apparently one of the puppies on Paw Patrol is a cop, and. I don't know what this puppy did on Paw Patrol, but he's got to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's 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 seriously absurd at this point. But um, as if you were looking for like a rational compromise to the statue debate, I think you found it. I mean, yeah. Well, he found it. He found it. Yeah, but you you brought <laughs> it to our attention. Yeah. Um, that 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 would be uh, I could get behind that, and I'm on the fence with the statues. I mean, I just don't care really one way or the other. Is kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Um, I mean, it doesn't offend me one way or the other, but. I think for the people that are passionate about keeping them and the people that are passionate about wanting them down, like mm -hmm. that's a, that's a fair compromise. Yeah. I, I think it's dangerous to try and, um, pretend that some piece of history didn't happen. Well, I agree. And, and that, so that's really, but that's really where we're heading with this. This is where all of this is going is that we're going to be in a society that won't acknowledge that these things happen. Then you can't talk about yeah, it. Yeah. Just whitewash the whole whitewash thing. Whitewash the whole thing because it's not just the statues. They're talking about, um, one of the tunnels in Mobile, I guess it's the George Wallace. They're yeah. wanting to rename it. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know why I couldn't think of that name because that's like obviously which tunnel they're talking about. Yeah. Well, and uh, you know the interesting thing about that guy is that he probably wasn't a real serious racist. Like he made a shift in his career that yeah. was a politically motivated shift. Yeah. Um, um, well, they and they were talking about that on NPR on the way here about George Wallace in particular that. Um, that he didn't want any of these monuments because they were talking about that in reference to one of them. Mm -hmm. That's it's not in our state in another state that, um, with that they wanted this monument taken down and that, that he didn't want that monument in the first place, that he was mm -hmm. against all of these monuments. Yeah. So, um, I, I don't know. I mean, like I say, well, um, as long as we're whitewashing things, and we're not. As long as we're we're revealing things that are trying to be whitewashed. Yes. Um, let's go ahead and get ourselves in trouble. This is probably an appropriate point to get ourselves in trouble to make sure that I think we've dug enough of yeah, a hole. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, not yet. Well, I think. Well, we probably both of us have said enough on this podcast and fifty whatever episodes to uh, ensure that we never at least get a major party uh, endorsement for a candidacy for anything. <laughs> the Libertarian um, Party always have us. <laughs> Shouldn't say that. They may not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it depends on who you're asking, right? Well, that's you true. Know, the, the Libertarian Party has moved very left too, at least that like the National Party has. Yeah. Um, that seems to be changing, but we'll see. Um, anyway, uh, so there... Uh, there are statistics worth pointing out here as long as we've been talking about the police violence. And like I said on the last episode, or, or you know, I, I think you agreed, is that we want to push the narrative away from the... <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Um, we want to push the narrative away from the, the racism thing. Yeah. Um, and it's not to say that there isn't racism, um, although I think it's less of a factor than it's being played up to be. Yeah. And the real issue is that it, it's us against the state the state's the real yeah. the real danger here not not because you're black uh more likely i think because you're poor yeah. um oh and, absolutely and, you know and that's Being part the, of the I've legal system when i've debated with the cop that was something that came up more than once was mm -hmm. that because he was like well you'll end up with the rich people have all this protection and the poor people won't have any and mm -hmm. i was i just all i said was i was like yeah it's not like the poor people are getting it real good right now anyway yeah <laughs> and, oh he, he, like but it made him think and it made everybody that was watching think like mm -hmm. you know that's true you know? yeah i mean these communities are underserved anyway mm -hmm. So my yeah. bad. Just oh no no problem. We can get we'll get back on that later because yeah. we're we're definitely gonna hit this whole abolish the police hashtag. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
I, I mean, I just wanted to pull some statistics again. Like, you know, I, I push and push and push. I, I like, I'm just trying to keep things in perspective here. Yeah. Um, now it, it, you know, the idea that police are out there slaughtering black people in the streets and they're targeting black people, I think is silly. Um, yeah. that's, that's not really the issue. Um, now that being said, uh, certainly, um, black people are affected by this more than others, uh, yeah. at a higher rate by the population. Eh? Um, so just as an, as an example, um, the, uh, in nationwide, this is FBI statistics from a couple of years ago, cause they're, they're always behind. Yeah, they're right? not, they're like, not. Um, but the FBI statistics from a couple of years ago, uh, say that in the nationwide murders um, that were prosecuted, uh, that, um, well, actually, you know, let's get to that in a second. Um, I, I suppose where you start is that since the Washington Post has been tracking the um, people killed by police yeah. in, in the U.S., the numbers have remained remarkably consistent um, no matter what kind of changes they make in how they're doing law enforcement, adding uh, uh, whatever the body cameras, cameras, body yeah. cameras, and all that stuff, doesn't seem to matter. Police kill about a thousand Americans every year, um, wow. and you know there's like a huge percentage of those people were armed. By the yeah. way, um, that so, were that were killed. I mean, it's something like eighty percent of the people that were killed by police were armed. So you can say a portion of that would be justified. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Um, now, where you run into these uh, these issues is uh, it's like about half of those thousand people every year um, that are killed by police are white. Yeah. Uh, but whites represent like sixty percent of the population. Portion, proportion right. of the society. Yeah. Um, about a quarter of them are black, and uh, blacks represent thirteen percent of the population, roughly tw yeah. between twelve and a half and thirteen percent. So, um, you know, blacks are killed at a rate twice as high as their representation within the population. And yeah. that's what people seem to be focusing on. Yeah. But sometimes you got to tell both sides of the story. Yeah. Um, so when you go into the, the murder rates, um, 44 and a half percent of murder victims in 2018, according to the FBI statistics were black. Wow. Almost that's... half of the murder victims were, were black. And that is, that's massive. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. Um, but here's the, the other side of that. Yeah. Uh, 48.3% of the uh, murder murderers yeah. were also black. We're also black, yeah. <laughs> right? Of the total. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then you, like, I went into Chicago, so I decided to look at Chicago, uh, yeah. where blacks represent a much higher percentage of the population. Yeah. Um, so they're about 13% nationwide. They're like 30% of Chicago. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, so in Chicago, 80% um, of the murder victims were black. Wow. That's that's insane. Yeah. Um and about 71% of the uh, of the murder arrests are black. Wow. Wow. So you can and it this actually and something like 74% of the total arrests in Chicago are black. Yeah. Um now you can make uh some excuses about how well there are a higher percentage of the population that they are targeted to some degree. Um, you can say, you know, when you're looking at the arrest statistics, um, and you can, we can talk about the things that we talked about last time that the drug war, uh, you yeah, know, uh, the drug war has a huge impact on some of those numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are a bunch of people that are being arrested for things that we don't really consider crimes, Yeah, but murder is definitely a crime. Oh, murder is absolutely a crime. All right. Yeah. And so the thing that you have to recognize though, through all this is that even if they're being uh, unfairly targeted and so forth, the rates of these arrests and so forth show that it seems very clear that black people are co committing a higher proportion of oh. crimes than other groups. Yeah. And so they are necessarily um, run into more antagonistic interactions with police. Yeah. Yeah. Just by the nature of that being of those numbers mm -hmm. being what they are. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of factors that go into this. This, yeah. is, this is not, I, you know, I'm certainly not making any claim that there's some kind of cultural thing or certainly no genetic thing no. Um, that is the cause of this. Um, and you can start making some claims about how, well, this is a legacy of, of uh, the racism that kept them out of the workplace. Um, you can... Uh, talk about, uh, you know, it's a legacy of slavery where they were never really allowed to, to go out on their own or something like this. But 
Um, I, I mean, I would point out to some of those things that uh, the U.S. arrested all the Japanese Americans pretty much in World War II and put them in camps. Yeah. Um, and World War I it was the German Americans, who were white, by the way. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so although race was defined very differently <laughs> in the early 20th century than it is now, because yeah. um, Italians were a le- lesser race and Irish were a lesser race. And, you know, the, yeah. there were a whole lot of splits among what we would all consider white people now. Yeah. Um, but there... There certainly are some trends, and like I said, I think that it's more economic than anything else, and probably if you had the same kind of urban white poor um, that you, like, that you have black uh, poor, uh, urban black poor, um, you would see higher uh, arrest rates for white people, too. Um, Big difference is that a lot of the the white poor are in less, um, less... population dense areas and also yeah. just as a result essentially don't have as many act- interactions with the police yeah right yeah. um but uh you know you can blame all these outside factors but at some point too you kind of well, got to do some introspection you have here. to well and and you have to look at things through real eyes like mm-hmm. what the realities are because you're not going to fix any of these problems by not acknowledging that they exist yeah i mean you're just not yeah and I think that a lot of it is, uh, you know, I picked Chicago partly um, because it's like the highest murder rate in the country. So it's yeah. easy to pull statistics. Um, but also Chicago is a city that has been completely controlled by the uh, Democrat Party for a long time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Long time. And, um, you know, I heard Obama out there saying, uh, you know, the, the only way to fix these problems is to elect more Democrats at all levels. Yeah. And I would like to point out here that um, they've, that has the, not helped. Yeah. The places <laughs> where the Democrats have controlled things for a long time yeah. are some of the worst. Oh yeah. Um, for this. And I would use that to try and, um, prop up the idea that a lot of this, uh, is a result of the war on poverty. Yeah. Um, the, the, the government inner interference in people's lives that, um, creates perverse incentives. And, you know, you had a time where um, where black families stayed together at a higher rate than white families. And that was before all of this welfare to try and help the poor uh, that has started incentivizing being a single mother. And I'm sorry, there is a um, there's certainly a social sociological effect of having generations and generations of men growing up in households where there's not a man to be a role model. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it would have to. I mean. And so, uh, you know, like all things, I blame the government in the end. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, go go listen to um, uh, Thomas Sowell. Uh, yeah. Thomas Sowell talks about this a lot. There's a oh, million Thomas Sowell videos on YouTube. Or uh, read his book, um, the, uh, oh gosh, what's it called? It was so good. <laughs> I just got it back from a friend that I'd lent it to the other day, too, and I, I can't think of the name of it. Um, but it's uh, Civil Rights, Rhetoric and Reality. Ah. Uh, yeah. Well, um, read it. It's I interesting. Just, I just know him from Twitter and whatnot, and I post, man, I post, anybody that follows me on Facebook knows, um, like, I post stuff from him all the time because he's he always seems to just hit the nail on the head, at least on Twitter because, like I say, I reshare his stuff all the time. Yeah. Um, I do, there's not really an appropriate place to stick this, but this is a piece of information I wanted to throw in there just somewhere. So this will do. Yeah. It'll be a nice transition maybe into the last little bit that we want to, we want to talk about. Um, oh, I do also want to say, as long as we're on this point before I move into my non sequitur and then (laughs) into the next thing, um, that the whole racial focus of this, I think is, uh, is clearly to me a uh, a ploy by the government and their you know the media, the media lapdogs yeah. um, to keep us to divide us to keep us yeah. looking sideways at each other instead of looking up at them well, um, as the cause. And we I think we talked about that on the last podcast. And that's it's absolutely it, 
deserves being said here again, mm -hmm. that the only way we fix any of these problems is to come together to do it. Um, and what's going on right now, particularly in the media, is it's divide. They, they are intentionally dividing the country, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's not healthy, and it's, it's dangerous. Yeah, and they have for a long time. They and it have, doesn't matter who's in charge but either because— it's uh, working right now. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Um, like, I mean, they, they always play these games, but— mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe, I, I, I don't know if I ever remember a time where it's worked as well as it's working now. And I don't know what's different, but something is different because mm -hmm. it's it's definitely working. Yeah, I, that may be true. I, I'm not really sure because I don't, I don't interact with the people as much. Well, um, I interact with people a lot, and I, I pay attention to the media a lot. And I'm mm -hmm. hoping, it, I mean, it is really working well right now. My hope would be, though, is that a lot of people are waking up at the same time and really paying attention to what's going on. And yeah. maybe if enough people like really start examining what's happening mm -hmm. and listening to podcasts, particularly podcasts like this, mm -hmm. maybe we can find a way to bring everybody together against the real enemy, yeah. which, as you know, is the government. Yeah. Um, I, and maybe not burn the government down. Maybe we just reform it. But, <laughs> I mean... That would be better than leaving it yeah. as it is. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm for burning it, it down, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, I just mean. Just roll it back. Um, that would at least be a step forward to, to <laughs> seriously fix some of these, because these are real problems, yeah. and real people are suffering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I would like to see some of these things addressed. Mm -hmm. I, I actually heard a uh, an old civil rights leader who's pulled out of the movement. Um, I can't think of his name right now. Uh Earlier today, though, uh, like just before we came in and recorded, um, who was talking about this phenomena that um, the money um, that's going to supposedly help the black community, whatever that means, um, a lot of it's being administered by black people. That yeah. some, he was, uh, I, I can't, like I said, I listened to this right before I came in, so I can't verify these statistics. Yeah. Um, but he was saying that something like two out of 10. Uh, white people with a college degree works for the government, and something like six out of ten black pe people that work has a college degree works for the government. Huh. My first thought on that was like that something like thirty percent of the country works for the government is really frightening to me. But <laughs> yeah, that scares the pants off of me. <laughs> yeah. um, but the point being that the these funds that are supposed to help these communities, these impoverished and underprivileged communities, is being administered in a lot of cases by members of those com supposed members of those yeah. communities by black people. Um, and what they're doing though, is that they're enriching themselves and using the talking points to further their own careers. And that money's not really making it down to where it's supposed to be. Yeah. Now I would suggest that the money from the government doesn't really help that much anyway. Yeah. Um, that, you know, you're better off getting out of people's way and letting them do their own thing. I mean, you, you have a lot of, uh, situations within these impoverished communities where they're doing like little side hustles yeah. that are, you know, little businesses on their own um, that technically are illegal because they don't have a license or, you know, whatever, all these barriers that are put in place to keep people from You're doing You're talking about want. my street pharmacist. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I am, but I'm also talking about people that braid hair and stuff well, yeah. like that. I mean, oh, that's true too. Yeah. You know. Um, so there's a lot of that, and I feel like uh, if you give people the opportunity to take care of themselves, uh, most of them will, and yeah. they're better off than if you take care of them. Oh, wow. um, every time. The, yeah, every time. There's the concept in the whole torture thing that came out with the CIA torture stuff and, and so forth, the idea of learned helplessness, yeah. and I think that that's what the government has done to a lot of these impoverished communities. Yeah. Um, not just black and brown people, but just impoverished All communities in general. In general. Yeah. Um, is this idea that you can't do it on your own. You need our help. Yeah. You would never make it without us, and it's a lie. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely is. Um, now I feel like I can't make my point, <laughs> but, uh, the, the point I wanted to make is, um, that George Floyd was, um, killed for, th there's actually a couple of points in this. Um, George Floyd was killed, uh, for supposedly passing off a counterfeit $20 bill. Yeah. All right. Um, or in the, the arrest subsequent to him passing off a counterfeit $20 yeah, that, bill. That's what his interaction was for. Yeah. Um, now one of my favorite bumper stickers from, uh, Liberty stickers is, um, 
your money's not, <laughs> things don't cost more. Your money's just worth less because the government's been counterfeiting. Yeah. Well, in the last couple of months, the government has counterfeited an additional $3 trillion. Oof. Just directly in, right? Yep. Just, oh, man. Yep, Just absolutely. insert that capital in there. So, yeah, in the second quarter of this year, the government injected $3 trillion of liquidity, of, of made-up money, yeah. Um, yeah. essentially, into the economy. And, uh, and no consequences for that. Right. I mean, there will be consequences, will. but nobody's, nobody's <laughs> well, going to jail. My and, fear is the consequences. Yeah. Like, I mean, there I've, probably will be I've people that I've seen what die. happened in Venezuela. Like, yeah. Yeah, like, that's scary. And I don't know that that's exactly what's going to happen. I pray it isn't, but yeah. God, man, that's scary. But the people that die aren't going to be the people that caused it either. Oh, no, they'll be fine. Yeah. Um, and so, like, this is two different kinds of counterfeiting, and, and you know, one of them is legal and one of them is not. Yeah. And the reason that the government is so concerned about people out on the street counterfeiting anyway is because that is a huge method of control is controlling the monetary system. Oh, yeah, yeah. They don't play with that. Um, so we're going to, I mean, I, my list of topics that we have to cover with General Flynn <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. the Fed... And the uh, Palestinian conflict, uh, which they're also annexing territory again. Uh, you know, this is Hadn't an important heard about thing. That, yeah. Well, I mean, it's not getting any news, but it's happening. Yeah. Um, you know, these are all things that we have to get to at some point. I may do a Palestinian thing on my own this weekend, actually. I do. Because uh, we're so far past due on that, and there's stuff yeah. happening right now. And I know that you don't keep up with That's that. That's more much. your wheelhouse yeah. anyway. So. Um, so I may do that. I got a bunch of things that I have to do this weekend. So I'm not sure that's going to happen, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, of course our last topic is going to have to be, cause we're 50 minutes in here, um, is the, uh, the abolish the police hashtag. Ah, yes. Yes. So how do you feel about abolishing the police? I, to me, and this is kind of where I stand with it is if, Tell me if, about your conversation with the cop. <laughs> yeah, oh, I got into it with the cop. I didn't get into it. We had a fun, me and the cop at the DMV had a fun conversation in front of a rather large audience. Yeah. <laughs> it was entertaining. But um, as far as where I stand kind of personally with it is I think if the if the community comes together and says, we want to do away with the police in our community, I think it should be done. I mean, I think that that's, that goes back to self-government, that if, if the community feels like they're not being serviced by these police, then, then they have the right to dissolve them. Um, yeah. And I think it's tyrant, it's, it's, it's tyrancy any other way, because if, if the people of the community want them gone and they can't get rid of them, then that's, that, that's just wrong to me. Yeah. So, well, I mean, that's, that's a clear sign of tyranny there. Yeah, that absolutely. We, we want your law enforcement out. Nope. Yeah, you can't do that, especially yeah. when there's a when there's a clear majority pushing for it. Yeah, um, and that that can get hard to read and be difficult. So I understand all of that, but um, like I say, and like I say, me and the cop went round and round because um, he immediately went to to well, you know, if there's no police, it'll just be anarchy and there'll be fight, people fighting in the streets. So and I was like, well, maybe, but at some point a group will step in. Like it may be a private group. Yeah. Well, the concern is that it ends up being a group like the mafia. Well, that's, that's actually what he said. He was like, well, cause I kind of laid some stuff out and he was like, well, that to me, that just sounds like the cartel. Mm -hmm. And of course my retort to that is, well, if it turns into the cartel, the, they can't, legally steal your stuff so you have to voluntarily interact with them yeah. so if nobody hires them they won't have the power mm -hmm. to to overtake yeah well the idea of no police doesn't mean that there's not a legal framework yeah. I, I think that it's within reason to have government provide a legal framework but it doesn't have to control every level of that legal framework which is where we're at now yeah yeah uh, and the thing that we complain about the most here in terms of justice reform is that if your government like you know the the courts, the law enforcement, the legislators, they're all paid by the same people. Yeah. And and it's technically us, but we <laughs> don't have any choice in the matter, so they're not beholden to us in any way. Yeah. Um and and that's the problem. Now, I think that this is a great opportunity for libertarians um because libertarians have been pushing to abolish the police for a long time. Yeah. Um at least a lot of them have. I'm sure yeah. that that's not universal, but Yeah. Um, libertarians are on board with, uh, with privatizing security. Yeah. Uh, and you know, that's essentially what we're talking about. And a lot of places already have private security. Yeah. That's not really, it's, it's not a new concept. When you, when you talk about abolishing the police, you're not, 
talking about leaving people without any protection. You're just talking about privatizing it. Yeah. And I know that the even the term privatizing is scary to a bunch of people. Well, it's it shouldn't. It is. It absolutely is. And that's that's kind of wh- where I was going with the conversation with the cop over it was mm-hmm. like that immediately turns people off. But you, what you have to remember is when they're privatized, they don't get your money unless you give it to them. Yeah. It's not at the hand. It's not behind force. Right. So the only way that they can become a monopoly is if they're just that good. Yeah. Because there will always be a competitor. Mm-hmm. So that's, you have to, and it comes, it goes back to another misconception is that people think that without government monopolies would form, but we know it's the opposite. The, yeah. the only way a monopoly forms is through the hand of government. Right. So yeah, it, it's just, it's just misconceptions and it's, it's educating people to these misconceptions. That mm-hmm. is our challenge. Yeah. Well, and I I think that it's important to recognize that this is an opportunity for libertarians to get out there and support this idea of abolishing the police. Yeah. Um, I do have a warning in that, too, yeah. because most of these people that are pushing to abolish the police are yeah. looking for a different answer yeah. than what we're well, looking for. they're looking for a government answer. Like, at the end of the day, they're, they're pushing to get rid of the police, mm-hmm. but they're going to... When when it comes when that happens, they're going to push for more government in one way or another. Yeah, well, and uh, my fear in this is that um, instead of police, we'll have social justice warriors. Yeah. Uh, oh man. Oh god. Out there and oh. making sure that we don't uh, say anything wrong. Yeah. Um, no, no wrong we'll, thing we'll, out there. We'll replace them with the oh. thought police. Yeah. I mean, there's some things that have been thrown out there that I like the idea of. Um, you know, I like the idea of. Uh, you know, sending, uh, you know, medical professionals or counselors or whatever when you have uh, drug issues that are called in instead of police. Oh, I um, so support that in so many ways. You know, there's a lot of things here, but... Actually help people. Yeah, yeah. You know. Um, I mean, but you still have to deal with violent crime. Well, yeah, you and you um, need an armed, or <clears throat> I say an armed, but you need a group to do that. Mm-hmm. You but, need an armed group. You do. Oh, yeah. you absolutely do. Yeah. Um, um, now, of course, there is also the option of like really uh, bringing in the Second Amendment here and saying that if everybody has the ability to defend themselves, you probably need less um, <laughs> extra security than yeah than we do right now. It's but true. the the important thing to to recognize here for libertarians is that there has been the Overton window has expanded some. Yeah. Like, you know, and for those that don't know, the Overton window is essentially this idea that there are only a certain number of ideas that can be discussed in polite society. Um, It's like the range of things that are acceptable to discuss among the public. Um, And a lot of libertarian ideas are thrown out of that from that we're outside the Overton window to begin with. Um, And this is one of them that has historically been outside the Overton window. And it's out there and it's openly being discussed. Yeah. But this is, these are kind of opportunities that we look for when there's something dramatic enough that people start talking about one of the things that we've been talking about for a long time. And they may not be talking about it in the same way that we are, but we've spent a whole bunch of time thinking about how this would work, how to implement this. that doesn't mean we don't have the answer and can't be ready to 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 start persuading people right and you want to talk about uh, uh, possibilities here like one of the first things that I heard is that how could any business ever get insurance if there was no police force um, yeah. if there was no way of protecting the the property and the the business how could they ever get insurance well all right if you're that um, you're that guy trying to open your business and you're trying to get insurance, and I'm the insurance guy, yeah. and this is how that goes. Uh, the insurance guy says, um, do you have uh, security to cover the property, to protect the property? Yeah. And if you say no, then I say, well, uh, here is a list of security companies um, that we approve. That we recommend, uh, yeah. That you can uh, you can make your own contract with and just give us verification that you have a contract with them. Or if you prefer, we can add to your premium and we'll provide uh, the security that is necessary. Yeah. Well, there you go. Problem solved. Like, yeah, it's not a complicated. Right. <laughs> and okay, fine. So businesses can do this. What about what about you know poor communities? Yeah. Every place now, maybe it's well. Actually, I've lived in some pretty terrible neighborhoods actually in my life, but there's been a few where, yeah, you know, I I was definitely on the wrong side of the tracks, as it were. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
everywhere that I've ever lived has had some kind of homeowners association or property owners association. Yeah. Um, and so a property like at the condo that I own, um, there's a property owners association there. I have to pay a tremendous amount of money every month so that the, uh, the property owners association can get insurance, yeah. like, you know, actual property insurance, yeah. um, for the location. This I'll is just keep. another one of those things. All yeah. right. Well, you know, we got to uh, collect this much from all our property owners or homeowners every month so that we can, uh, hire the security agency. Well, and, and, and if they don't perform, they get replaced. That's exactly the point I was fixing to make is that that the private industry always does it better. So, And if they don't, you find someone else who does. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the big difference with the policing. And the point I was kind of making with the cop was because his point was, you know, well, the people that will suffer will be the poor in this situation. Mm-hmm. And, and all I was trying to really tell him was they're already suffering. Like, yeah. and there's no accountability and there's nothing that can be done. Mm-hmm. Like they, these, these areas are underserviced and there's no way it's not being fixed. Yeah. Um, and this may be a way to fix that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it may not, I mean, who knows, but it's, it's another option. Yeah. Well, certainly they're in a position where they feel like the, the public service is, um, providing more harm than good. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think that that's un- an unreasonable position. For no, them to it's take. not. I mean, if um, I've, I've wor- I hadn't lived in any of these areas, so I can't really speak to that, but I've mm-hmm. worked a good amount of time in Pritchard and some of these areas. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're wasting your time calling the cops. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it, it's pointless. Like they're not coming. Yeah. Like, and, and when they do, it's going to be hours later and they're just going to make some notes and leave. Yeah. I worked as an EMT in Pritchard for a little while. Did you? Yeah. Um, and you know how every time uh, you dial nine one one and call for an ambulance, you get an ambulance, a fire truck, and a police car. Yeah, yeah. Not in Pritchard. Not in Pritchard. Yeah, <laughs> you're uh, lucky to get any of them, right? A- ambulance showed up. Oh yeah, that's that was it. it. We showed yeah. up. Yeah, right. No police. No police. No fire truck. I mean, I've I've worked over there and, and been in enough situations where we needed police assistance and couldn't get it. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I mean, you didn't even really bother to get it because you knew you weren't <laughs> like yeah. they're not coming. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so there are alternatives, and of course, somebody I was talking to about the you know how the communities would handle this um, is uh, she said, well, okay, so then what happens is. Um, the first time there's some kind of violent interaction between the security force that the homeowners association hired and somebody in the neighborhood and, you know, somebody or, you know, somebody in the neighborhood that's not necessarily a part of the neighborhood doesn't really matter. But, um, I I just want to make it clear that it's not necessarily a homeowner or, you know, somebody who lives It could go either way. Right. Um, and, and, you know, that person gets shot and killed or seriously injured or whatever, then lawsuits start and any good attorney is going out after the security company, the homeowners association and every individual in that, uh, establishment that, that paid into the system and anybody yeah. who is paying dues. Yeah. Um, and I said, well, okay, I like, I understand your point there, but that's what insurance is for. That yeah. security agency is going to have insurance, yeah. um, and that insurance company is going to have reinsurance. This, like we've already got systems that handle this kind of thing, and to yeah. me, it is no different than medical. Yeah, right. Like we're talking about life or dis- death situations there, where very bad things can happen, and doctors go after entire hospital systems, yeah. um, or attorneys go after entire hospital systems uh, yeah. when things go wrong. But they have insurance; they have their own legal counsel. I mean, it's yeah. not a slam dunk. Yeah, and well, exactly, and I mean, like I say, there there'll be situations where like someone acted wrong, and they'll be, mm-hmm. the justice will be served. Yeah, you know? and the the big thing there is that that person will probably be prosecuted under criminal law if they work for a private company, unlike yeah. uh, when um, they work for a police force. Well, there, and, there will be real accountability. Yeah, uh, and the other part of that is that uh, yeah, there. There was another part of that, and I got distracted and I lost it. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll come to me uh, as soon as we stop recording, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's the same as the as the medical system. There's, you know, there's insurance for that. There's reinsurance. There's their own legal systems. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, and there's accountability for the, the private companies involved. And I, oh, this, this was the other thing. I knew if I just, like... <laughs> Went on for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I said uh, to her, you know, well, now you got to, she says, well, now you got to pay for all this extra. Their insurance goes up and so forth. You know, now you got to pay for all this extra stuff. I was like, yeah, you're doing that now. Yeah. You're already you're, paying that. And the, the difference is you have no choice. Yeah. Exactly. You can't replace them. Yeah, exactly. And they're not accountable when they need to be. Yeah. For at least for the most part. I mean, they're, you know. Yeah. And of course, the truth is that even in these cities where they've already started abolishing the police forces, um, you're not getting any of your tax money back. Oh, no. Like, no, they're not no, reducing no. taxes to, they're, they're just funneling that money into some other public program. Exactly. Um, usually already existing public programs. So they may even raise your taxes in the end for whatever they play, replace their police force with. But yeah. anyway, well, it's a start, though. At least the conversation's being had. Yeah. And like I say, the big thing, and the big thing I would tell people is just, um, you know, start talking to people and, you know, try to convince people of some of these things, mm-hmm. you know, because that, that, that's really the big thing is, is changing some of these misconceptions and, you yeah. know, educating people. I feel like a DMV full of people got a good education this past <laughs> yeah. week. And, and what triggered the start of that conversation? The shirt I was wearing. I had a Liberty Mike shirt with taxation of theft across the back of it. Nice. And the, um, the cop saw it and immediately started questioning me about different things. And we, we had a good talk. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people learned a lot at the DMV that day. Good, good. So. <laughs> people, because people rarely learn anything at the DMV. <laughs> um, yeah. You would think that they would learn that maybe they shouldn't put so much faith in government. It but. was funny. So I was, <laughs> I had a bad trip to the DMV. Um, I, I won't get into all the details of it, but as I was leaving, I had to come back again because I didn't have all the things I needed because they didn't tell me all the things that I needed when we called and asked them specifically. Anyway, I'll go on the tirade, so I'll stop. But I, I leaned over to the cop as I was leaving, and I shouldn't have leaned over to him. I should have made a big thing in front of everybody like we had been doing the past hour. Mm-hmm. But... um. And told him, I was like, by the way, this is why I'm a libertarian. It's because of places like the DMV. Like, yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the cops, per se, because yeah. you know, that was the debate we had been having. I was like, it's this. It's the bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is what makes me a libertarian. Yeah. So. Well, um, go to places I need to wrap up. I think Exciting so. Exciting stories of the DMV. Good days at the DMV. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, as always, um, follow us on Facebook, iTunes. I don't know. Podbean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you can subscribe on iTunes and Podbean. Um, that's great. Like and share. Uh, yeah. um, comments. Help us get this in front of people. Yeah. Comments are great. I've had a. I had a few reviews. People comment this week yeah some people request to be on the show yeah <laughs> I, I, I think that. i'm riding down to the uh convention in orlando with one of them so maybe maybe i'll hey, bring the mics in the you, car i was gonna say <laughs> you could you could make somebody's dream come true yeah. man <laughs> <laughs> hey yeah and you won't be down there if i have to if no. i want to do a um, podcast from the convention y'all can i know who podcast. to contact absolutely i think yeah. y'all should yeah that would be that, fun i think that'd be good um all right yeah so like and share like and share, comment, like and share, uh, review. Positive reviews are better than negative reviews, but reviews of any kind really. <laughs> but be honest. <laughs> yeah, are are helpful. Uh, oh, and still looking out for anybody who wants to help improve the website that has a real understanding of um, of WordPress, particularly uh, HTML. I've got some nice add-ons that make things relatively easy, but not easy enough for me apparently. <laughs> so um, if you're interested in doing any of that. Contact me, uh, Michael at the Liberty and um, I'd be happy to have any help. And because I definitely want to improve things. As as our list of podcasts has gotten longer now, it's just like one giant scroll down to the bottom. Yeah. And I got to fix that, and I I just I can't seem to figure out how. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that would be that would be great. Uh, and then we will be back in a week, uh, if not sooner, um, if I do a podcast this weekend. Um, and, uh, but you'll Liberty Larry and I'll be back in a week. Absolutely. And, uh, in the meantime, try and stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.